Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox and thanks for logging on. This is Watches Tonight. Sean is on the switcher. This evening we chat in expanded format. We talk about how to buy a watch and how not to buy a watch. Personal experiences ahead. And I share your wrist shots tonight on Watches Tonight. If you haven't seen me on Instagram, check it out. You've seen the long video, which is Watches Tonight, the short video, which is the review. This is the one minute video, which is exclusive to Instagram. 2,500 videos and counting. You can binge watch my Instagram account and I only put up the best stuff. So check me out, Tim underscore Maso on Instagram. We have Arto Charles from New York City, Edward Ledden of Sweden, Joe Pinton from Louisville, Soma R, Enrique Cassiano. Greetings from Brazil tonight. Mateo C, Mark S from Brooklyn. We got Jim Millett, a regular on the Facebook group. Robert Anders from my old haunt in Long Island. McLauder from the Netherlands, staying up late. Miroslav from the Balkans, staying up late likewise. John A from Wales, UK. We have Jared, we have Bio, we have Renside, we have Deech, we got Sean. And we have Michael. Welcome, guys. Good to see you. This evening, I want to remind you, we still have one or two slots left for our collector conversations. Uh, mid to late fall at this point, we're almost booked up. The casting call on the show has gone really, really well. But if you're interested in talking to me sometime around November, early December, definitely reach out to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. If you are in the Northeast, we will find a way to make it work. On Watchbox Studios and Collect Conversations, you're the star. All right, viewer wrist shots number one. Michael K is in Latin America with his Patek Philippe 5961A. Oh my gosh, it's the ebony dial. That is the one to own and purchased from Watchbox, so thank you for trusting our company. David F goes for a walk with his Patek Philippe 5212A weekly calendar, looking good on a deluxe strap. Tom B. hits the street with his automotive-inspired Patek Philippe Calatrava 6006G. It is a very Patek wrist shot tonight. Tarek H. appreciates his 5726A Nautilus annual calendar, just like our own friend Drew Koblitz on a orange rubber strap. Looking good. By the way, if you haven't seen the Collector Conversation with Drew, check it out. Watches and cars all in one. Daniel R. And his Patek Philippe Aquanaut 5066A catch a view in Sanham, Sweden. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your wrist on my list. Who's joining in here? We have Abdul from Germany. We have John Goodman from Montana. We have Vegas Player, who I'm assuming is in Las Vegas. Mason One joining from the UK. Abdul actually says he's in Egypt this week. I see that. David G from California watching this instead of working. You're the man. What else is going on in the box? We have Scott T. Just bought a 5296G from Watchbox. Thank you so much for trusting our company. Send me a wrist shot. I'd love to see it. And of course, John N. joining in, a longtime viewer. Mirrored Anglage, welcome. So, how to buy and not buy a watch. This is an evolving topic. I've shot this episode in the past, but more gets learned all the time. First, because I'm in the industry. Second, because I got a lot of friends who are collectors. And third, because I'm constantly shopping and evaluating myself and it is a learning experience. It's a journey, not a destination. So my experience in the watch industry admittedly has been entirely on the retail side. I don't work for a manufacturer or have any real path to becoming a full-time watchmaker at Watchbox, although they do give me some ongoing education there. My collecting journey consists of years of quiet punctuated by rare editions. All of which is to say, I'm not that high turnover guy, but I see thousands of transactions per year at both wholesale and retail prices. I watch every online platform where watches are sold, and I probably spend more time on those platforms than I spend with some members of my family and friends. I'm in contact with hundreds of collectors around the world on a continuous basis, so I have input from all of them, in other words, I've experienced a hundred lifetimes of buying and selling watches, even though I am not myself a prolific collector. Sorry about hitting the mic there, guys. Tonight, I'm offering my advice regarding common mistakes and successful strategies experienced by collectors of luxury-grade watches. All right, we have 
Ren Sud liking the Patek Fever in the wrist shots right there. Abdul saying Patek's all over. Don't worry guys, I mix it up a little bit more later. I just couldn't resist having a Patek block. So let's talk about one of the biggest mistakes that people make when buying watches, which is buying the first year of a hot model. Now you've heard this said about cars, and in general that primarily implies that new cars aren't sorted and reliable as they'll be after a couple of years of production. And yes, Lucid, Tesla, Rivian, I am talking about you guys most, but not exclusively. Sometimes first year cars are also very hot to the point that that first year sports car or luxury SUV might be wait listed, there might be markups, even at the dealer level. But with watches, you tend to see watches that are going to flare and flame out do so very quickly, usually within 12 calendar years. And I should also mention that if you want to know why we often say don't buy the first year car, we owe a thanks to the 1957 Chrysler lineup, famously awful. That is where that rule of thumb came from, but I digress. While there can be some running improvements throughout the life of a watch, they generally come to market better sorted than cars, which are in the end much more complex products. Plus, watches can always be updated down the line during a subsequent service with new parts. No, no, the real reason to avoid buying a first year watch is the markups. For every Rolex Daytona that trades above list price in perpetuity, there are a hundred other models that run strong for the first year, maybe their first 18 months, and then they lose steam afterwards. And, and that is definitely the exception rather than the rule. Rolex is a unique beast, at least when it comes to sports watches. We will see there are even cases where Rolex watches tail off after the initial model year. So, the real reason that I want you guys to consider all of the following watches is that every single one is an exemplar of something that was white hot and then not. So, Critically, each one of these is now available all day long, new, and used at below MSRP prices. Starting with the 2013 Omega Speedmaster Moon Watch Dark Side of the Moon. For a hot minute, both for this one and the following year's Gray Side of the Moon, Omega learned what it was like to have Rolex wait lists, to be able to sell watches at list price, even out of the dealer. This was red hot, but again, by the time the Gray Side arrived, the wait lists were already abating. We were starting to see them on eBay. We were starting to see them on a much earlier version of Chrono 24. And if you waited just a little bit, you were no longer begging the dealer for an allocation or offering to pay some guy to buy it used for above list. You were getting this thing fairly easily and discounted. But wait, it happens at Rolex too, the 2017 Rolex Cellini Moonface. For a brief moment, it looked like this was going to be the watch that finally made Cellini a thing. Gorgeous, unusual, the first Rolex Moonface watch since the 1950s. 39 millimeters, red gold, very wearable, an enamel moon face with a meteorite moon disc. Oh my god, it was fantastic. And for about, I don't know, 12 months, there were wait lists, there were markups, people who had them up on Chrono could get premiums, and then the bottom just fell out. Suddenly people lost interest. Folks realized that every Cellini before this one was available for pennies on the dollar, so why should this be any exception? And we saw very quickly that anyone who wanted one was able to get one with very little difficulty. Breitling. We're doing the luxury three here, Omega, Rolex, and Breitling. Back in 2021, it seemed like the Georges Kern era at Breitling was finally hitting its stride. Watches that would, at last, make Breitling watches desirable, the kind of watches people wanted to buy at list price, the kind of watches that would be allocated to dealers, and they would know how many they got per year, and then no more, and there would be a mystique and an aura and a magic, a sort of exclusivity halo glow around Breitling watches, led by the premier B09 pistachio dial. And it had everything going on. No date dial, ahead of the curve green, manual wind, 40 millimeters, stainless steel, syringe hands. What could go wrong? Well, for about a year, nothing. Dealers were telling me they were getting one, two, maybe three, even in major markets. And yet now, if you look on Chrono 24, discounted all day long, used watches up to here, and you can get them for thousands less than retail, and retail, frankly, wasn't that high. 
So, proof that gravity does apply even to very hot watches that play to the meat of the market. Watches that design-wise did everything right. So, Zenith. Same year as the Breitling, the 2021 Chronomaster Sport. Very controversial because it looks a lot like a Rolex Daytona, but also very popular initially because it looks like a Rolex Daytona. And Zenith started doing the same thing Breitling had been doing. Allocations to dealers, you're only going to get so many. Offer it to your best customers, no discounts, that sort of thing. And wherever used watches were sold, including, for a brief period, Watchbox, you would pay list or even a little bit above if you wanted to own that watch right now without waiting. And of course, plenty of inventory today. Finally, a watch that was an absolute phenomenon. The 2022 Moon Swatch, the idea of taking a Omega Moon Watch aesthetic and making it in a swatch package with colors and plastics and Velcro straps. Fun, yes, but I didn't get how people were paying $2,500 for these used. That made no sense in the context of like a $265 watch back in 2022. Well, now the $270, but here's the thing. They can be found on eBay, where previously they went for four figures, and a lot of those prices, $275, $263, $250, that's retail or thereabouts. The bubble has popped. If you bought that thing for $2,500 a year ago, I hope you've got money to burn because you just burned it. All right. Let's talk about what's going on in the box. Abdul saying the moon swatch craze was definitely madness, and I have to agree with that. For what was essentially a battery-powered plastic watch that I'm almost certain swatch can make for 10 bucks, it was shocking. And as late as last fall, when I went to Zurich and I went to the Swatch store in Zurich, there was a line around the block waiting to get in there to buy the Moon Swatch. There was a huge distortion in the average wholesale value per unit of watch exported from Switzerland last year because they had almost 900,000 Moon Swatches made. And yet, there were only 15.8 million Swiss watches of every description made that year. So for the first time since the smartwatch onslaught, we saw this surge of Swiss watches priced under $300. Will it last? I don't think so, based on what we're already seeing on eBay. And I don't think that occasional special editions like the new Moonshine Gold Swiss National Day Moon Swatch are really going to move the needle. Just like the System 51 back in 2013, there's going to be a surge, a slump, and gradually we will find out what the sustainable demand is. Will it always be fun? Yes. Will it always be a scarce commodity? No. And I think already we've reached the point that it is not. What else is going on? Some are. Tim. Duograph Rose Gold, love the double chrono, versus Navi B0143 Rose Gold. Hmm, that is a great question. I find the Duograph a more interesting watch. I think the B01, though, is a very appealing piece since it is in a Navitimer platform. And at the end of the day, I've got a soft spot for the Navitimer because it's such a niche watch to be an icon of a brand. Watches like the Submariner and the Calatrava and the Reverso and the Moon Watch are popular and successful and iconic, and they sell en masse. Whereas something like the Navitimer, being so highly technical and unusual, is always going to be a little bit of an inside baseball watch. So I love the Navi. Rose gold is not my thing, but it might be yours if you're into that. I'm actually going to recommend you go for the Navitimer. See if you can find one a little bit smaller, though, a 41 or something along those lines, unless you like the bigger watch size. What else is going on? Jim Millet saying, still hard to get the Moon Swatch in the UK. A, apparently eBay is your friend. And it might be model dependent. I showed you the Mission to Mars, which is very popular, probably one of the most numerous. Mason one said, I was never interested in the moon swatch. Moon watch, yes. Moon swatch, no. And then we have a little discussion about whether the Seiko 5 can be serviced. Yes, and I've seen it done. We have Amit asking, well, I wanted to buy a Patek 6119G. Should I buy from Boutique AD? Would it be a bit better priced on secondary markets, pros or cons of AD versus secondary? The good news is Google is your friend. You know what it costs because on the Patek website, they show you the retail price, and that is the price the Patek dealer will charge. 
But if you go on Chrono, Watchbox, and other platforms that sell pre-owned watches, you can see what the going rate is. And this is the kind of thing where no matter where you are in the world, it's going to be very similar. We ship internationally, so do many of our rivals. And of course, Chrono dealers sell all over the place. So take a look. Remember, the watch is still new enough that many of them will be under warranty. Although, honestly, with the two-year warranty Patek offers, some of the earliest versions may already be out of warranty. I would pay a little bit more to get a watch that is still covered. What else is going on there? Carlos, see you soon, Tim. Bring the green glasses, please. Well, definitely. That'll be a lot of fun. The green glasses do travel with me, just no longer on my head. Now that I wear aluminum frames, they fall off and they crush my hair. What else is going on in there? We have Martin Lauber. We have Alan C. We got Mark S. saying he had to get rid of his 50-50. Crown was too uncomfortable. Uh, I'm guessing that is not a... Patek Philippe 5050 right there. We have Andrew T. Tim, what is your opinion of the Nivrel 5 minute repeaters with the Dubois de Praz module? Can it be a good affordable option to get into the world of repeaters? Yes, but make sure you got some sort of setup for servicing that. I believe a version of the Nivrel was used by Chrono Swiss for a long time. So I would say go out and find one of the examples from Chrono Swiss in a steel case without diamonds and you'll get the best version of all of that. We have Mr. Paradigm, 1981, who's a fan of the Patek Calatrava 6007G. You mean 6006G? No, 6007G. That's true. It started as an A, and now there are three white gold models. There's yellow, there's blue, and they're red. They're tough to wear. They're bigger than you think. I'm just going to throw that out there. All right, continuing with big mistakes and guidance. Don't buy a naked watch unless you understand the consequences. And this is a very serious thing. Many folks look for discounts by purchasing watches without box papers or both. And I'll be honest, this strategy does have its place. Here's when it's appropriate. Let's go over that first. Vintage watches. With watches older than 1990, there's rarely an expectation that you're going to get all this stuff because historically people didn't save it. The watch hobby as a thing was much less well established before 1990 and folks never imagined that they were going to be selling the watch on some global internet platform to a guy in Hong Kong who was going to want their original packaging. Also with vintage watches, condition and originality are everything. Don't hold out for a box if you're getting original hands, dial and an unrefinished case. Also, watches that have a comparatively low value. You know, we talked about Seiko 5, but this also goes for a lot of low-end Nomos and Tag Heuer type watches, Longines, Tissot, Mito. 10%, 15% of 1,000 to 2,000 bucks is not the end of the world when it comes time to sell that watch. I don't think you're going to miss the $100 to $200. It's not going to be a make or break type thing. And then watches you plan to keep forever. As long as you are confident in the condition, mechanical integrity, authenticity and originality, if you're going to buy that watch and own it forever, it's like you don't care about the resale value of a Jaguar if you know you're going to keep it until you die. And you don't care about the box and papers of a well-preserved, authentic watch if you're just going to wear it until you're dead. So that's when it's appropriate to not get a watch with box and papers. But I would ask for a full set with a modern Rolex watch. And I'll be honest to you, right now, the hit you're going to take is only somewhere between 10 to 15 percent. If it's something like this, like a 116500 LN, it's going to be somewhere between $1,000 and $2,000 versus what you would have gotten for the watch if it had been completely intact. And that's in the context of a watch with a pre-owned value between like thirty dollars and $35,000. The, the white dials are worth more. Black dial, for some reason, less common, not worth quite as much. But in either case, you're looking at somewhere between 10 and 15%. It's not utterly crushing in the context of the total value of the watch. And some have even said to me that it's more likely to be like a $1,000 to $2,000 flat penalty rather than a true scalable percentage. So so you can't necessarily extrapolate. But Rolex is a mass market manufacturer, so if you do want to set your watch apart at resale time from the tens of thousands of others on the market, it does help to have a full set. You're going to be in a crowded market and small distinguishing factors can make a difference. Okay, exotics suffer a lot more. So let's talk about Patek Philippe. They make it clear when you go on their website that they will not restore a certificate of origin. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what you pay them. It's definitely not the same as 
an extract from the archives. The certificate of origin is the birth certificate of your watch, and it's worth more than everything else among the box and papers. I can't tell you how many people have bought monster watches like Patek 5207Ps and 5208 Grand Complications. They strolled out the door after paying cash. They never thought to get the box, the papers, the accessories, and most importantly, the certificate of origin, which is the one thing you can't rebuild by buying up Patek accessories on eBay. Often, I have to admit, this happens when people buy watches on vacation or go to a watch tourism locale like New York City, Miami, Hong Kong, Singapore, Zurich, or Dubai. They don't want to carry the package. It's too much to add to their luggage. Or they don't want to have problems with customs at the airport. Or they simply forget to give the dealer the forwarding address for the set. And this is a big deal because when you're talking about Patek Philippe, we do talk about like a flat percentage of what you're going to lose. And from a truly desirable model, you know, you could be talking up to 20%. So if we're looking at a 5207P that's worth between 800000 and 12, well, $1,200,000, yeah, 20% off of that is quite a haircut. Now we're talking big league money, and even for the kind of person who can afford that watch, it's going to be hard to stomach losing 20% of $1.2 million because you didn't give the dealer a forwarding address for a box. Something to think about. Now, the more specialized the watch, the more particular the type of buyer and the more he's going to insist on getting a retail-like package of papers and accessories. So when you're selling a watch like this, rest assured, the guy who wants it is going to ask and he's going to care. And sometimes it can be a little bit unclear what percentage you're going to suffer, but you can deduce from the price of the accessories online how much you will lose from the collection, like FP Journe boxes from what I've been told to understand. FP Journe boxes cost between $5,000 and $10,000, depending on the size, the era, and if they are model specific, whether they're special edition oriented. So the idea of paying five dollars to $10,000 for a box is pretty obnoxious to me, but it gives you some sense of what's gonna be deducted from the price you can get for that watch when the time comes for selling. And also, like me, you'll start to feel the way I feel about naked watches. I feel the same way I feel about a polished watch or a watch with scratched off serial numbers. It grates on you over time and kills the buzz. And I can tell you I absolutely hate the idea of an over-polished, poorly preserved, or naked watch. As a collector now, I would never buy a watch like that. And I know a lot of you feel the way I do. Think about a car with a Carfax that says the car was hit and repainted and repaired and it was done at Joe Schmo's corner body shop. And I'm looking at this new 7 Series or Mercedes S-Class or G-Wagon and I'm thinking, this thing is already dead to me. And that's sort of how I feel about naked watches and badly refinished watches. And yes, I am starting to group those two things together. I had some JLC watches without all that kit. And I can tell you my relationship with those watches declined over time as I became a more discerning, discriminating, and experienced collector. And what seemed acceptable when I was less experienced seemed more and more revolting as time went by. So keep that in mind. That's definitely something you need to think about when buying a watch and a lesson I've learned. So this is a cautionary tale so you don't have to retrace my steps. You already know not to go for it. BNS saying, I guess that 20% on a $1 million watch will never be a problem of mine. Well, that's a problem I won't have either, so you're in good company. What else is going on? 24 degrees, what are your thoughts? I'm already fed up with my Rolex Submariner. I had it for two years. I'm trying to exchange it for a vintage Rolex Daydate. Well, adjust your expectations about durability because depending on how old that Daydate is, you might not even want to get it wet. Also, Daydates, by definition, are precious metal. So if you've gotten used to the durability of a Submariner, especially with a ceramic bezel, you're going to want to really think twice about how and where you wear the Daydate. Also, frankly, with vintage Daydates, you do start to find that bracelet stretch is an issue, so double check that before you sign for anything or you write a check. Also, with older day dates, if you want to get something that's got a lot of collectible potential, try to find a double quick set tridor without diamonds on the dial. That'll be a really, really collectible piece, highly discontinued unconventional, hard to find. Condition is everything with day dates too. Being precious metal, they wear down quickly, never mind refinishing. I, I think day dates are awesome. Just make sure you adjust your expectations for a relatively delicate, older, 
precious metal dress watch versus a hardcore sports watch in your Submariner. Randy Allen, been considering a Crater or Chronograph. What's your opinion? Um, concerned about servicing. Yeah, that's going to be a thing. You may have to send it back to Japan. There's a lot of Crador in the Japanese market that doesn't exist externally. So things like chronographs, travel watches, not the micro artist studio Patek-like things we're used to seeing from Crador in the United States and Europe. And I think the most important thing is going to be condition and recent service documentation. If you are worried about sending it for service, it would be nice to have the peace of mind that you won't have to deal with that for a couple of years. Whereas if the watch is a couple of years old and it hasn't been back for service, you might want to call Seiko and figure out what the arrangement is for one of those if you want to have it serviced from a US or European base, like if you live in the US or Europe. So that's something to consider. Martin S., I like dressy VC watches, but I just don't get how they can ask that much. I would only buy them used. The Historique American 1921 is my favorite. Yes. Vacheron resale is pretty awful. The one exception is the overseas, of course. And then, really, I think the dress watches are a great opportunity. You will pay more for a 1921. I really like the mid size 1921, though. I think that's a fantastic option that's often overlooked. What else is going on? Abdul saying Tridor is on my list, hopefully 2024. And then we have. Mason once saying a few years back I bought a Navitimer box and warranty cards so I took to eBay to reassemble the manuals training disc and everything to make a full set just me being a completionist that's okay I would do the same thing we have stagecoach saying I love the VC green tourbillon VC green and tourbillon are all good things what else is going on in the box right here we have AH is the Rolex C does does Rolex CPO count as naked? You know, it's interesting because it's such a new thing, it hasn't really been rolled out yet, but I guess we're gonna be finding out more and more about what kind of documentation you get. At the very least, you will get a bunch of CPO documentation that verifies the watch is authentic that the watch is in good running order, that the watch has been blessed by a Rolex dealer. So I would say if you've got the CPO documentation, you're probably okay. I would be very surprised though if something came in CPO without a full set. I, I, I think you could probably internally as the CPO dealer reconstruct a lot of that history, especially if the watch is still under warranty. Remember, the watch has to be older than three years, but the Rolex warranty is five years, so that's something to think about right there. Plus, I know that Rolex dealers have plenty of boxes and manuals, so if that's all you need, that can absolutely be reconstructed. We have Hugo asking, what do you think of the Blancpain 50 Fathoms annual calendar? Frankly, I'm still kind of waiting to find out what the definitive next generation 50 Fathoms is going to look like after all of these 70th anniversary special editions. I just want to know what replaces the 50... 15, please, just tell me, what replaces the 5015, what does it look like, and what's it going to cost? All right, jumping back to our regularly scheduled program with some wrist shots. Marceau R. appreciates the unconventional beauty of the Ulysse Norden Freak X. Bob J. captures the Blancpain 50 Fathoms Bathyscaphe ceramic in Monastery Beach, California. James S. wears his Breguet Marine in a marine environment off Iceland with humpback whales. Always nice to see. Thomas P. is off Dorset, England with his JLC Reverso that is new to him. An uptick and his Rolex Explorer appreciate the atomium in Brussels, Belgium. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your watch on this box. All right, guys, let's keep this thing rolling. Let's talk about mistakes made when purchasing watches. Never buy your second or third choice. I shot last week's show about higher value alternatives to hype watches. My intention was to introduce watches that you might find just as appealing for less money. If you want a Nautilus and not a Cartier, then buying the Cartier means you're going to wind up with it and the Nautilus, inevitably. My idea was to show you something you might enjoy just as much, but if you know you're not, and you've got your heart set on the Nautilus, pay the $69,000 and wait in line at the dealer, because you will wind up paying the $69,000 for the Patek, 
and the $7,750 for the Cartier. You're going to buy twice and you're going to have regrets and then you're going to have another watch floating around that you don't love and don't wear. So if you're absolutely sure, that's one of those times when I don't want you to try to substitute a high value alternative for a hype watch. The Cartier alternative idea only works if you feel like you've discovered a way to have the same fun for less money. If you don't have as much fun with the alternative watch, then you're going to wind up buying two, three, or as many times as necessary to own the watch you really wanted in the first place. So between the watch that you buy and the watch that you want, there's going to be a lot of wasted money. Settling isn't the same thing as finding an equally appealing alternative that costs less. That's what I wanted you to do. I didn't want you to settle. My intention isn't to suggest that you buy a watch you flat out don't love. Oh, Okay, this is another one, and it's a huge mistake collectors make, especially in the world of Rolex, where if you have the money, you can go out and buy whatever you want because there's a ton of them and the supply is flush. Never attempt to run the table with purchases. And by that, I mean get into this daisy chaining of rapid purchases. A lot of people know three, four, five watches out how they're going to continue their collection. And the biggest mistake people make when they have the ability to write the check and the plan in place is that they start buying the watches rapid fire and they fail to savor the moment to build memories around each one of those watches and to enjoy what I consider to be the most pleasurable part of buying a watch learning, discovering, talking to other people who have experience, who are experts on forums and at watch clubs and watch enthusiast meetups. I want to learn, if I'm going to buy a Reverso and a Navitimer and a Moonwatch and a Submariner, I want to absolutely immerse myself in the history and the legend and the lore of all of those. I want to learn about every generation. I want to learn about the obscurities and the weird niche models. I want to learn about all the special editions that came out over the years or the models that might be difficult to find. A Comex Submariner, a Brazilian domestic market reverso, uh, perhaps some sort of moon watch that has a rare COSC chronometer certification from the early 90s. That process of discovering your watch will lead you to fall more deeply in love. And then by the time you buy the watch, you are knowledgeable and an authority on the model. You know where the community of like-minded collectors is, so it becomes just as much experience and social club as an ownership. And also, frankly, I've always found that a watch that's an experience more than just a possession becomes a lot more fun. And having built that whole story arc from first discovery to expertise and purchase, now you've got memories built around this watch from the moment you put it on your wrist, you're more likely to enjoy it in the long run. Whereas if you just buy, 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 you're never going to get any of that. And what you're probably going to do at some point is sell, sell, sell. That jackrabbiting from one watch to another, or as I like to say, running the table, is the best way to ensure that you feel like you wasted money, shortchanged yourself, and focused more on the purchase aspect of the watch more than the experience aspect of the watch. There's also the need to savor the watch and enjoy it once you get it. Once you get that Submariner, you know, go on a vacation to the Bahamas, attend your kid's graduation or a grandson's marriage, you know, something like that. Build a couple of real world memories around one watch before you proceed to the next. This way, the watch represents, yes, everything the watch is, but a whole bunch of personal stuff that's not generic. And that, I think, is how you find lasting satisfaction. So, do not buy the cheapest example of a watch that you can find. Like, I'm looking perpetually, and this is just like one of my obsessions, for the perfect 1990s 8th generation supercharged Riviera. And that car probably will cost twenty-five dollars to $30,000, and it will be blue on blue or green on green. But one thing that's for sure is that if I wanted to go out and spend $2,500 to get a supercharged 90s Riviera, I could do that right now. I could buy 10 of them. They're everywhere. Super cheap, worn out, haggard, and ragged. Easy to do. High spec, condition, provenance, outstanding, preservation, much tougher. 
You can go online and find a super cheap Royal Oak or a super cheap Manual Wine Daytona or a horrendously over-polished Patek Philippe 1526 Perpetual Calendar, but you're immediately going to regret it. You'll never enjoy the watch because it's obviously a compromise. It looks sad and it makes you feel that way when you're wearing it. If you wanted this, but this is what you got. Not because you plan to do a nut and bolt restoration, but because you wanted to get the cheapest possible mid-60s Mustang, you would absolutely not be getting the experience you imagined, and then you've actually spent real money, but you've gotten effectively nothing for it. And that's real frustrating and discouraging, and that can sour you on the watch hobby very quickly. If it's rough enough, think an over-polished Royal Oak. You might be even embarrassed to show it to other collectors, and then the social aspect is gone. You won't want to take a wrist shot of that and post it up on a forum or send it to me here on Watches Tonight. So don't buy the cheapest one you can find. I, I will say this. Outcomes get significantly worse from there. The idea that the cheapest watch is just going to be ugly is one thing. But then, there are other reasons why people underprice watches. Something that's too good to be true usually is. Oftentimes, a watch that is super cheap is a stolen watch. You've got someone who knows he's got hot property, and he's looking to palm it off as quickly as possible by selling it 20-30% below market. Hey, when your acquisition price is zero, your profit margin is huge, even if you sell the watch 30% below market value. There's also the possibility that it's a counterfeit. For the same reason someone will try a quick turn when he has a stolen watch, someone will attempt a quick turn when he's selling a counterfeit watch. The quicker he can palm it off on you, the quicker he can disappear with your money. If he charges market pricing, he's going to start answering questions about the watch, which is the last thing he wants to do. He doesn't want you asking for boxes, papers, invoices, close-up photos. Counterfeit watches, stolen watches, often priced below market. Franken watches, and maybe not in ways that are visible. A lot of Franken watches get priced low because the collector knows that while he's selling a Rolex 6239 Paul Newman Daytona, inside it's actually a bunch of Benrus V72 parts. Or you might find that there's some sort of 1980s Rolex that's got a bunch of aftermarket bridges inside. Yeah, you can find stuff like that to complete a Rolex movement, aftermarket bridges that fit. So you've got to really be careful about these super cheap watches because getting an ugly watch is actually the best outcome. Getting a watch that you can never resell that may have no value or very little value, that also happens. There's only one exception I can really think of where I know someone bought the worst, cheapest example of a watch on the market and he was absolutely happy with it. Mark Cho, who's the founder of the Armory and great watch collector and connoisseur, bought the cheapest Patek Philippe 1526 he could find. And I think it was the 1526, but it was over-polished, it was a little bit ragged, I think there was some oxidation on the dial. But he said, look, I bought it to wear it, I wanted one that wasn't an investment, I wanted one that I could wear in good conscience and not feel like I needed a force field around my wrist. And so that's why he bought the cheapest one, but it came from a reputable dealer, it was documented, it was mechanically well-serviced and in good running order. He specifically had this idea of a beater vintage Patek in mind. That doesn't come along too often. So unless you're that particular guy, avoid. Now, do not buy without extensive and explicit after-sales support and a credible dealer. Buy the seller is a common refrain in the watch collecting world, but what does it mean in practice? Well, first, Google is your friend. You want to check for reviews. And remember, you're looking for patterns, not isolated cases. You don't want to be swayed by one guy who had the greatest experience in the world or one guy who swears that these people are criminals and should all go to jail. You want to look at a long-term history of good reviews. I can tell you from a company that sells thousands of watches a year, every once in a while there will be one guy who has a transaction and he feels really bad about it and nothing we do can make it right amid thousands of people who are very, very satisfied. So I would look for patterns overall. Excellent reviews consistently over a period of years are a good sign that the dealer is credible and in it for the long haul and has a reputation that they don't want to lose built up laboriously over time. So look for patterns and look for a lot of data points. Two reviews, no matter how glowing, is not a history. Also, Check for things like wiring instructions. If someone claims to be based in San Francisco, but the bank is in Serbia, ask why. 
That's a big red flag right there, and it's more common than you think. Are you being asked to wire the money to a war zone, for example? Uh, does the receiving institution share an address with a Soviet space dog? These are big red flags, very, very red flags in that case. And it's something to look for that costs you nothing to check and may prevent you from spending a lot of money to get nothing or a bill of goods. Also important, does the dealer have a store, like a physical store, or even just a standalone online storefront other than eBay and Chrono24? Better dealers are gonna have either stores you can go to, a physical footprint, or they're gonna have a freestanding website that exists on its own server and has security encryption for e-commerce and a large array of real photographs of actual inventory, testimonials from clients who give real phone numbers and email addresses and names. And all of that is just a little bit more difficult to do than setting up a Chrono or an eBay store where you can absolutely be a dabbler or a fly-by-night operation. It's tougher to set up a real commitment, building out a website that has years worth of inventory photos or actually leasing a shop in a major city like New York or Los Angeles or London. Also important, how are the photos? In an era when everyone has a 4K camera in his phone, there's no excuse for taking bad photos. I can take a photo today with a phone that looks better than something Ansel Adams would have taken using specialized equipment made for professionals. Heck, I can even take 4K movies. So if a dealer has really bad photos that don't give you a clear view of the movement or the case or the dial or they're blurry or they don't show necessary details or there's only two or three photos, avoid. There's no excuse for that, especially in the realm of professionals, but even an amateur can do better than that these days. That's usually something that you need to regard with suspicion. And frankly, for me, bad photos is just disqualifying. As a dealer, you need to be able to look at the photo and realize if it is or isn't appropriate. Also, if there's any doubt about whether the dealer actually has the watch in the photos, ask them to show you the watch set to some weird time. Say, I would like to see the watch set to 1137, for example. And if they say, well, I can't do that, the watch is not at my store, facility, house, wherever. That's a problem. If you don't actually have the watch that you're selling, bare minimum, you're not qualified to talk about its condition, how well it's been serviced, whether it's operational, bare minimum. Worst case scenario, it's a fraud. Now, also important, anything bought online needs to come with a no questions asked return policy. It's the nature of buying something online. This is a sensual product. The way it looks, the way it feels, details matter, all these things. So you should be able to buy the watch online, put it on your wrist, wear it for a couple of days, send it back just because you don't like it. Too big, too small. These are the pitfalls of buying something you've only seen in photos with wrists that are not yours. And to be perfectly honest, an online dealer that doesn't give you that kind of flexibility should be discounted immediately. Now, you need guarantees that any dealer warranty entails either factory service or service by people who are certified by the factory. So if a dealer says, I have Rolex or Omega certified watchmakers, ask to see the certification, maybe check with the brand to see that they're legit. But if they have that certification, that's fine. They, they can service a watch in-house if a warranty claim needs to be made. But if you have some guy claiming that the JLC dual met is going to go to his local dude or guy. Uh, that's an absolute disaster. Your local guy cannot handle a Duo Met or a Patek Philippe Tourbillon or an FP Journe Resonance. So if that's where the watch is going, if you make a warranty claim, forget it. Either insist on a commitment to actually send the watch to its manufacturer or look somewhere else or get a huge discount the size of a service charge from the manufacturer. Also, you need to have a phone number you can call to reach the owner or manager of your dealer. There are a lot of dealers online. Check them out that are set up to make it almost impossible to call a person. That's disgraceful. You walk into any boutique and a human being is present. The idea that you could be selling the exact same product online and not make a person available is beyond insulting. Imagine if you walked into a Rolex boutique and every case was locked and there's nothing but security cameras, no people come out to greet you, you don't see another human face, and you're expected to just swipe your credit card, leave, and take 
a shipment of the watch at your house. It would be beyond insulting. You need to have that human interaction, if only to get a better sense of the dealer, but also to ask relevant questions about this very expensive thing you're about to buy. Let's see what you guys are saying in the box. Noah's dad, where do you land on polishing the overseas? Have a rose gold with a couple of scratches. Kind of bothers me on that watch. Well, if, if the scratches are sufficiently small, I would say don't worry about it because you know what's going to happen if you polish it. You're going to scratch it again almost immediately. I would refinish once. That, that would be my preference. Refinish it once and then put it into soft rotation where you're not going to wear it for action-packed sports watch applications. Like that's going to be your watch to take to the opera. Once you have it refinished, you can only level a precious metal or ex excruciatingly detailed finish like so many times before you lose the intrinsic qualities of the watch. And I've actually weighed precious metal watches that went back to service and platinum and gold watches have come back two to three grams lighter. So material is definitely removed. Keep that in mind because that's a disaster for a lot of folks who value the integrity of the watch. When your watch is factory finished but scratched, it has a lot of integrity. But when your watch is refinished and then scratched again, you don't have the factory finish or a watch that's free of scratches. So just keep that in mind. It will get scratched again unless you take it out of regular rotation and only use it for very low impact activities. We have a question from Justin D. Thoughts on the Belcanto? I think it's fun to have a chiming watch that's so relatively affordable. Uh, you know, limit your expectations for how sonorous the chime is going to be. The one thing I don't like about the bel canto is the, the appearance of it. Th there's something, it's got like a bootleg Ulysse Norden look to it. And I think the size is great, the way it fits is great, the idea is awesome. I like a watch that chimes for, you know, fractions of what you'll pay the JLCs of the world. But at the end of the day, I don't love the way the dial looks. So this is going to be hugely individual. If you love the way the dial looks, I have no problem with it. I think it's a great purchase. And what else is going on right here? We have Matthew D. logging in from Denver, Colorado. Great to see you, Matthew. Thank you for joining us. All right, let's take a quick look at what else we've got. Viewer wrist shots number three. Marcio M. is in South Beach, Florida with his IWC Pilot Watch Mark 20 and AMG strap. Looking good. I like mat mixing and matching with that teal strap. Jeff S. of San Diego reminds us of the brilliant of the Blanc Path 50 Fathoms Bath the Scaff Chrono, which he gifted himself for his 40th birthday. I like that idea. I'm turning 40 next year. I might follow suit. Ben K. from Singapore and his Omega Speedmaster wait for the ferry in Atsu, Japan. The ferry, which, by the way, looks like it came straight out of Showboat. We also have Ben K. from Singapore and his, uh, well, pardon me, Demetrius P., who captures his Omega Speedmaster, we got two Speedmasters in a row confusing me. First Omega in space and his Aventon fixed gear bike. Sean K rides in his Audi with a custom Sartori Biard SB04 from France. Armand Biard, a gentleman and an artisan. Check him out. And send your wrist chats to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Okay, how to buy and not to buy a watch. Now we talk about the money stuff. Never borrow money to buy a watch. Scrooge McDuck will have more fun with your money than you have with your watch. This is a very personal and emotional purchase, and if it's not truly yours, you will not bond with it. Never finance fun, because I find these two things are mutually exclusive. Debt is stressful. Watches should be the alternative. Also, debt is a burden and a depressant, and frankly, it just brings me down. For education, it's an investment. For a house, it's an investment. For a utilitarian car as opposed to a fun car, it's a necessary evil. But for a luxury, really avoid financing fun. A watch should be a pure pleasure, intensely personal, and not something you are forced to share with a bank or a credit card company. Now, never buy a watch you can't comfortably reach with your budget. Just out of reach? immensely disturbing. I would also say, although some people will overextend, this is second to financing in the don'ts. Overextending for a luxury is a needless way of adding stress to your life. Look at that dog. Does he look satisfied? No, and he never will be. He's not getting there. Even if he barks at the cookie, he's not getting any closer. Goals are great motivators and morale boosters, and the eventual success and acquisition of the watch once you've saved up enough will make it even more enjoyable. Also, never buy a watch over retail 
inside an authorized dealer's showroom. I've seen Mercedes dealers where they charge 300,000 over list for a Galendewagen, and it's obnoxious. I'm looking at you, Audemars Piguet, in the watch world, because they've already said they're gonna allow their boutiques to sell over list price and add market adjustments. I haven't seen any confirmed case of this yet, but it's coming. And although this won't happen at a Patek or a Rolex dealer, a lot of other dealers, authorized dealers of other brands, will absolutely slather on a premium just for you to pay retail. $10,000 on top of list price? No thank you. We've already talked about not buying first year models that are particularly hot. Dealer markups are even another reason for that. Finally, we have viewerist shots number four. Johnny P explores Little Italy with his Italian heritage Panerai Luminor Power Reserve. Albert W and his Omega Speedmaster are at San Diego Comic Con with Star Wars movie props, genuinely neat, the real, I'm told. Lance V and his Oris Aquas New York Harbor are at San Diego near the glider launch. Giancarlo P and his Seiko take a dive into the pool in tropical heat, and Eric N takes us home with his Porsche 911 GTS and Tissot Sideral. Very cool, guys. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. This episode was an epic, but it was a lot of fun, and I loved the chat. Thanks to all of you. Thanks to Sean. Timeout, Tim out. Thanks for logging on.